Perfect. Take. Ah, there we yeah, go. I'm gonna have to uh, more time here. Okay, for so for those of you just joining us now at this portion of the meeting, this is the this is the highlight of our uh, our, our May U.S. chapter forum, and I'm about and we'll hand over to Robert Makani, who can introduce himself and his his talk today. So over to you, Robert. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, so uh, as Andrew said, Robert McKinney, looks like we have a small group. Arthur, Jeff, Bob, two one two, someone from New York, and mysterious AC. So. If you uh, have any questions in, in during this presentation, I really, really prefer open forum and more workshop setting, especially when there's only, you know, I don't know, three or four of us. And um, clearly that doesn't work maybe in a larger group, but for this group, if you have any questions or have anything, just raise your hand or, or just really, since I'll be looking over here and you guys are, I, think I actually can put this in front of here. Um, you know, just let me know if you have any questions really. Uh, so, so as Andrew had said, um, uh, I'm going to just go to me first and I'll come back. I think this is a little out of order. Uh, name is Robert McKinney. Um, I have been working in the Texas market for a number of years now, I'd say about 15 years. And prior to that, I worked as a uh, legislative aide uh, while I was in graduate school in um, Washington State. So uh, part of that, I, I say that because my background is in policy, public administration, and then, and then planning. And then once I came into the field, I realized I lacked a lot of technical skills and had to get around folks like Arthur and, and others to, to um, absorb some technical training. Um, and that's how Arthur and I um, became, I would say, colleagues and, and, and friends uh, through the Texas market and some of the work that we've done here. All right. As Andrew said, I'm an AICP. I'm also a CTP with, with the American Planning Association. There's only about 100 of us in the country that are certified transportation planners. Um, I also am the um, incoming chair for the American Planning Association's Transportation Planning Division. I know that was a mouthful. Um, there's about 3,000 members in that division. And, um, and then also I serve in a variety of different capacities with the American Planning Association and, and locally here. Uh, I really, really think transportation is the key to how societies work and how societies maintain themselves. I know that you know some folks would say housing and other things, but um, I've, I've been on many, many projects where they say, well, I need a road before I can build a house. And so um, not many houses are built without roads and, um, and, and so forth. And I know there's some, I think there's some freight folks on here as well. Clearly we need freight to move around goods. And, and so it, it fascinates me in all, in all aspects. And uh, it's funny, I gave a presentation to my son's kindergarten class. <laughs> And I, and I broke down, I had to break down transportation to five-year-olds. And, uh, and I really, I think it, I think it helped me because sometimes I overthink things and it's, and it's really just moving goods and people from point A to point B and how we do that. Uh, and so this is just one aspect of transportation planning uh, and transportation implementation. So I'm gonna go back up to our firm. Uh, what we do is, is we connect capital communities. So what we're trying to do in, in our firm, at least primarily Texas, Louisiana, uh, markets are, um, we're trying to uh, develop an excellent plan, an excellent path forward with a strong vision, strong mission, strong goals, just like any good planner would do. And then we try to find funding or try to help them find funding. And then we bring that funding in and then we implement, help them with implementation. And so we kind of have three different arms, if you will, our planning, our engineering, and then our implementers or our administrative crew. And so all of that works really well together. Um, and so what, we, what we've what we coined this is, is, is human capital, social capital, and financial capital. Uh, human capital is just leaders, like good folks really in your organization, right? Um, professional engineers, environmentalists, uh, um, just leaders within their, their firms. And we have social capital, because I don't think we can do anything without talking to people. I think we need to go out and talk to people and ask them really what they want, what they desire, especially in microtransit, what I'm about to talk about. And then financial capital, and this is where we come in with funding pursuit, politics. You know, this swings this swings wildly depending on administrations how funding funding is uh, allocated, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, that's really our core and our ethos. And I've been doing this for a number of years, and really enjoy um, seeing projects be implemented. We're not a planning team that's just going to go out and give a big, you know, here's a, you know, I think there's some freight folks. So here's a big freight plan where it's just, it's just not feasible. And we all kind of look at it as professionals and say, okay, that's cool. But, you know, let, let's be real. We don't have $10 billion to spend on, on this plan. We have a billion. So what we do is we come in and we say, well, what's the highest need within this plan to spend your billion dollars on? Anyway, going back to um, microtransit, why I was brought in here 
is um, our firm has completed and, and, and I've been the project principal slash manager on, on several micro transit projects. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll explain what micro transit is here in a minute. So, you know, we'll talk about a little bit, you know, how micro transit is coming on the scene. It's really been a game changer in public transportation uh, and also, you know, some ways that we go about planning for micro transit and some different federal sources for that. So I'm gonna pause there and see if there's any questions before I jump into micro transit. All right. I think you're good. Good to keep going. Yes. Great. All right. So why, what is, what is really micro transit? Why is it an evolving mode? We have these various ways of moving folks around in cities. Um, we have what, what I would consider public transit and mass transit. Public transit's really serving our most needy. Um, and I would say public transit's been typically our demand response service, um, fixed route to an extent, depending on where it is. And then we have mass transit. Mass transit's going to be more your your, uh, I would say, rail, um, uh, bus rapid transit, you know, high capacity vehicles that are, that are bringing folks, you know, to and from typically in larger cities. Um, and, and so what we found in the industry, and, and, and I think Arthur's watched this industry grow, is that we had public transit and mass transit, and we were kind of trying to shove it together to see, okay, let's try to, let's try to fund both. And what I found, I think, really in the 2000s is, you know, what I, saw was that we couldn't fund both well. We could do really well at you know, a fixed route and a public transit system, much like I'll say uh, via in San Antonio has done great, great uh, um, local bus, great demand response service. And you know, I would say more DART focused on mass transit and really great mass transit and their local service, you know, good local service, but maybe not as robust. And so, you know, we kind of kept working through this problem as an industry and we, and we had this demand response program where you could dial a ride. It was also called dial a ride. You could dial a ride and say, hey, I want to ride in 24 hours from point A to point B within the service area. And that was really how demand response service worked. And so, you know, within a service area, we're going to use Austin because that's where I live. It's, you know, 40 square miles. So you can see, you already can see the logistical problem with this. I've just now locked in a vehicle for an entire day for one trip. And as that, you know, exponentially gets more and more expensive. So what happened was um, really microtransit, it, it came on the scene really in, in, I would say, kind of the Uber Lyft era, because what we really needed was a way to uh, book trips quickly, right? And then, and then also figure out a way how to geofence or, or make a box around an area where now I can take two or three trips within a box with that same vehicle, usually within an hour. So you can see how the efficiencies just went way up. And so what we really needed, I mean, I think it was software as a service that, that, that really kind of um, changed transit. And, and there's still, it's really emerging. And I would say there's some really big firms and also uh, a lot of venture capital coming into this market because software as a service gets venture capital. I'm sure you guys all know this, right? And you dump in all this research money and then, and then you hope you hit it. Well, I think that a few firms have, have hit the, the, the sweet spot here. And so really it's this hybrid flex between Uber Lyft, if you, I'm, I'm assuming if you've taken an Uber or Lyft or know what that is, um, and it works within a certain zone. So what we did is we said, okay, no more big zones, let's do small zones. And let's figure out where these small zones need to be, because now we can, you know, most folks don't need to go 20 miles. They need to go one or two miles. They need to go to the Walmart. That's typical here in Texas, or they need to go to whatever, right? They need to go to the grocery store or to the library or whatever. And that's usually one to three miles. And so how do we create a box to allow for this efficiency to, to, to come up? Um, and so it's app-based. It's got this, you know, slick interface. It's kind of like Uber and Lyft, but what we've seen in the market is we have council members that say, look, I don't want to push Uber and Lyft out. So, you know, how do we create a product that public transit isn't completely subsidizing the trip where it's a dollar, right? Or what's the service level of this, of this public transit that isn't as good as the private market? And we kind of, and I think most of you probably know that private market goods are typically, typically better or, or stronger than public market goods, because if it was if it was a, if we could sell it, we would in the private market, right? That's why the public market exists. So, so what we've done is we've reduced the wait times to 20 minutes instead of, you know, three minutes or seven minutes in these little zones, like you would with get an Uber. Um, you have to share a ride. Typically there's a lot of pooled trips. Um, and so the service quality is a little bit less than the private market. 
I'm going to change the slide because that 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 thing was kind of bothering me there. Um, so so really, why why is it a game changer? Well, first of all, it's 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 taking off like wildfire across the U.S. Um, and I would imagine in, in some other parts of the world, but I you know we focus on the U.S. Um, and it's just every 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 day you're reading something like uh, Lockhart, Texas, just recently uh, did a uh, microtransit program. Um, we just did one, and we're, our firm helped Cats and Baton Rouge. That, by the way, Arthur, they just kicked off their microtransit program. Arthur helped us on that a bit. Um, in um, Baker, which was just north of uh, Baton Rouge, you know, here we go, Knoxville, Palo Alto. I mean, so many cities have have started this program. And the reason why this program is 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 really taken off is because you you a lot of uh, transit agencies are comparing it to fixed route. You have a fixed route and you have different densities with this fixed route. A high density does quite well with fixed route. A medium density does okay with fixed route and a low density typically performs pretty poorly with fixed route. When I say poorly, I mean, you know, a couple of riders an hour, three, five, seven riders an hour, which is pretty poor compared to more dense where you're gonna get, you know, maybe, gosh, you could get 40, 50, 60 riders an hour. And so you can see where, okay, how do I use my scarce resources to provide the best possible service? And so in these lower density or medium density areas, what we found is we can just eliminate that fixed route because it's just, it's just one line and you're getting a little bit of access along that line and then create a zone around this, this low density area, run a couple buses out there and you've reduced your wait time compared to the fixed route. You have a higher quality of service because the bus comes to your house or comes real close to your house. Um, it's way less capital intensive because you don't need a bus stop or a bus pad or a shelter. You don't have to maintain those. Um, and there's just, there's just higher operational efficiencies. And that's why as the education of this and the service has gotten better and better, and I mean the, more the, the uh, operational service and also the technology has gotten stronger. This has just taken off across the country. Um, and so there's a couple of other things that, that we'll talk about, make sure I, I don't miss it. Yeah, the other thing about microtransit that I found out, I was just finishing a study for the Conroe, city of Conroe. Something I thought about with microtransit is you have this fixed route and you have folks that can access the fixed route. And I should have put a map on here, I'm sorry, but essentially think about it this way. You've got one line and you can walk about a half mile to that bus stop. So if you're transit dependent, you have to live on that line. Like that's just, if you're transit dependent, you gotta live near a bus, period. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever been transit dependent, but that's kind of the, yes. kind of the deal. But with microtransit, you can live anywhere within the zone which makes a really big change in people's access to housing. And as we talk about housing stock going out of control all over our country, and we have folks that are lower income, think about, you know, this is really designed, it's a public good for, for lower income individuals that typically don't have a car, that's who we're, that's the market here. Now they don't just have to live in a segment of the community, but they could live throughout anywhere in the community that that microtransit zone goes. And so we did this study for Conroe and we looked and we saw, look, You've just increased access to, you know, 30% more of your multifamily homes for folks that are transit dependent. Now, why I say that's important is because, you know, if you look at the rent costs, it could be stronger or higher near the transit line and lower away from the transit line. So you've given people access to different housing choices just by changing the way that the bus basically operates within a zone. And communities are starting to sense this and you're seeing it just, you know, again, explode in, in, in popularity. Um, but to get to microtransit, there's a variety of different planning um, pieces. And that's, you know, I, I was kind of brought in to talk about the planning. You know, we, we certainly need an existing conditions assessment. Are there any underperforming routes? Or is there, um, you know, is there actually potential and need? We look at the movement of people. And here's the other piece to this that's, that's come into play is that now we're tracking cell phones. Not now, we've been tracking cell phones, but we're doing it at a much faster and um, I would say more efficient manner as a society or as an as a, as a industry. And so what we can do is we can buy cell phone data, break it down into these big, you know, uh, well, it's really only 100 meter by 100 meter blocks, which isn't that big, but we can't do someone's house and follow them um, due to privacy reasons. But we can get these blocks and we can see, oh, wow, we know where these people are going now or any within this community. Are they staying within our boundary? Where do we cut this boundary? Where is the best part? And that's part of the planning that's really changed for microtransit. Because if you think back 
in the 2000s that I was talking about or the 90s, we had die of the ride. We really didn't, we didn't quite know where people were going without old school um, uh, surveys, tell us your zip code of where you're going, or we were using uh, the travel demand model, which had its own um, challenges. But now I feel like with this, the penetration rate on these cell phone, we, we're buying some cell phone data all the time. The penetration rate is 25,000, you know, I mean, try to get a survey and, and get 25,000 people to take it, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's really rich and incredible. And so there's another software as a service kind of bleeding into the industry to help us do better in, in public transportation. And then, you know, that was kind of that on-demand service zone. Um, and we can run transit simulations. There's another software service that's come in. Um, there's companies like Spare Labs and Via and, and some of these other companies that are designing um, simulation tools that say, okay, if you have these ma this many people based on Google Maps cell phone data to tell you, you know, it takes you 10 minutes to go from A to B, they're running all that through with their software engineers. And then you say, okay, well, how many vehicles do I need? And I want to have this kind of wait time. And I want to have this kind of transfer time or uh, pool. It's called pool time, meaning how many people you're going to be in there in the car with you. Um, and I want, you know, the max walking distance. So you can pull all these levers to create a service and then run a simulation model to tell you how many vehicles you need, which is really important because you need to know how many vehicles you need because then you know what your operating costs, you know what you need to procure, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, the next one is this, you know, this mobility as a service, the technology solutions. There's, there's a, I mean, there was like one firm they were doing great. Now there's 12 firms, you know, um, I, I guess I'm recording, but I'm going to say God bless capitalism because that's exactly what happened in this industry. Um, and, and, and it's great because it's brought down the price. It's created, you know, it's created competition, et cetera. Um, and then we, you know, we can model price it and we have to procure the vehicles. Um, this is a real challenge right now. In our, in our, um, oh, you have a question? Oh, no. Okay. Oh, whoops. Um, this is a real challenge in our industry right now, procuring vehicles. I can't imagine it's not in yours too or, or whatever, wherever um, subset you are in transportation. I mean, vehicles right now are taking, I don't know, forever. And, and so we're really needing to, to really push the envelope for these communities and say, hey, look, if you're wanting to do this, you need to start procuring your vehicles today. Um, and you might get your vehicle in, I don't know, 2024, whatever, whatever the, 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 the lag is. Um, and so this, this is going to catch up to us, the, the vehicle, um, the delay in vehicles being manufactured. I think it hasn't caught up to us yet because we're not past our useful life of the, of the last fleet, if you will. Um, and so this, this, will be, this will be a thorn in our side in the, in the near future. And then, and then you have, you know, your service launch and, and you continually monitor and optimize, et cetera. A um, couple of things I want to just just point out through this is that you know the, the big piece is, is is like we did here. This is our our Baton Rouge work. You really need to know where people are going um, because again, you know, breaking it down to my 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 son's kindergarten class, it's it's really one person from A to B. And how are we going to get them there? And it can be through microtransit, public transit, auto, bike, walk, all these different modes, right? And so what we do is we we follow that travel pattern and we say, okay, would this person use this product? given these parameters? That's really the key question. I um, mean, and, and, it, and it really boils down to social science and understanding human behavior and predictability, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, then we have trade-offs because it's like, okay, would the, will we get some ridership if we have a 20 minute wait time or a 40 minute wait time? You know, I don't know. Like if you're at home, does it really matter if it's 40 minutes? You just, you know, you got to book it 40 minutes in advance. I, you know, and so we're kind of starting to tinker with this as an industry. Like what is that optimal time that we can book a trip. Now on your destination side, if you're just going to the store for a few minutes, then that can be more challenging a 40 minute wait time because then you're sitting at the store, you know, longer than you probably want to. Um, and then walk distance. So you can set these walk distances. So to essentially the, the bus can pick you up. They have, they have, we, we can have zones where we say, okay, we're going to pick, we're going to pick, if you're within a half mile or really half miles too far, a quarter mile of, you know, this particular stop, this is where we're going to pick everybody up and then just and then distribute everybody from that stop. It's really optimizing the movement of people. It, and um, and so, you know, that's that's here, you know, incorporating various technologies and, and um, you know, how does the fixed route interact with it? That's the other thing I wanted to talk about here, which is complementing the fixed route. So so we can have first last mile where we say, look, we're going to pick you up and then put you on the larger system. Right. I mean, you think. It's, it's really brilliant because this is what airlines do, right? We, we pick up in Omaha, we send you to Dallas, then we send you to San Francisco, right? It's kind of the same thing here. It's, we're gonna pick you up in, in rural, bring you to suburban, and then send you down to urban. 
And that's, and that's been a real, um, I would say game changer as well. And then, you know, we talk about integration. Uh, this is, this is a challenge. And, and I'll just say that, that we have a lot of smart folks that are, um, developing these programs, but a lot of these smart folks are, are, I would say, a bit younger coming out of San Francisco, New York, uh, no offense to the person in New York, but what they're not understanding is like in Baton Rouge, we had a, I, I forget Arthur, I'm, I, I might be making this that up, but I know it was in the 20%, 25% unbanked population in the, in, the, in the community that we were working in. And so when you have a 25% or 20 some percent unbanked population, not everybody has a, a phone or a credit card or a, <laughs> You know, like, so, so we're still dealing with some of the most needy, um, uh, you know, in, in needy in an in a, in a economic sense population where we have to, you know, if we're going to provide this public good, we have to make sure we're providing the public good, not just to people that can, can access it because of the tools that they have, which we all know a cell phone costs money. We all know that apps and internet, et cetera, cost, cost funds. So things that we're trying to work out as an industry, how do we make sure that we truly keep this as a public good? Because when we have public money, we really want to open it up to all um, and, and not just limit it to a few. And I, I know there's, there, we could, we could have lots of beers over that and talk about that, but <laughs> that's what we're at least attempting to do. And so, you know, that this, this uh, integration, payment integration, operational integration, call centers, you know, we've got folks that are you know, 75 years old that have maybe never used a, they've always called a dial a ride. And now we're like, hey, grab your phone and, you know, check out this Wizzy app that I have. Um, and that's a, that's a real challenge in, our, in, in this scenario. So, so there's some pros and cons to the, to the microtransit. A couple different models to, to uh, um, implement microtransit. I've given this several times to several clients and I can tell you 99% of the time they go model B, full turnkey. <laughs> they don't want to deal with it, um, but there's some there's some uh, pros and cons to both. A it's called a partial turnkey where you own some of the vehicles, or or you own the maybe you operate you contract out vehicles maintenance, and it's really these four buckets of vehicles operating uh, maintenance administration where we where we um, where we have to either we do it in house or we contract that out as, as the, the agency. And most of the time when we're just starting out a new program, it's mostly contracted out um, unless the city has some vehicles laying around or they reallocate city or agency, I should say a property, um, unless they reallocate some of their buses. We also have labor union issues with this as well. If you reallocate buses, you could have some labor union issues um, of how many hours are within the, the contract. So there's you know, there's all of these intricacies that are that are behind the scenes in, in implementing microtransit. Uh, you know, I mean, in our industry, you can't walk around the corner without hearing about EJA. I'm gonna call it EJA, I-I-J-A, um, or the bill. Uh, there's a lot of new money here, um, and some things that was in the bill for microtransit was, uh, you know, we've got an, an increase in in a significant increase. I think it's about 20% increase just across the board in the allocation. For, for trans, transit. And then within um, the, some of the programs, which is, which is this is key, this, the CMAC program, which is congestion mitigation air quality. And so CMAC is a program that is in, in communities that are in non-attainment, meaning their air quality is, is, is poorer than some of the others. And they can spend funds, they get a little extra funds to spend on, on transit programs. Well, microtransit got, got placed into this program as an eligible expense, which is, which is big for them. Uh, and then, and then we've got some, you know, innovative mobility grant. A lot of microtransit comes out of there, um, and then all of it is, you know, it's all innovative now. Who knows what it'll be called in the next bill? But we have this, uh, you know, innovative coordinated access program and 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 other programs where communities can go and and start that the, the microtransit if they so choose. But but most of the time, it's just a reallocation of their existing pot of money and into a more efficient, um, better, I would say probably stronger transit um, uh, uh, service model in the, with the right demographic and um, uh, land use characteristics. And so I just wanted to be clear there. It's not, it doesn't work everywhere, but it's working in this more lower medium density in, uh, places. And, and, you know, it's, it's funny. I have a, uh, our, our owner, Barry Goodman, um, he is a, a terrific planner, been around. He started Houston Metro. He's been around for, you know, since 1970 something, 78. Um, and he was chief legal, legal counsel of, of FTA. And he said for a number of years to me, he's like, you know, or to the staff, 
transit's the only industry that just hasn't reinvented themselves. And, and, um, and I would tend to agree with them for the longest time. And then, and then we, we started to reinvent ourselves. It took some venture capital. It took some, um, you know, some, some apps and some, <laughs> some software as a service and a, and a few different tools. But I think that we're on our way to providing a better transit service that's, that's um, not you know, underperforming and also providing people more access, et cetera. So um, that's micro, oh, there's micro transit in a, in a nutshell in I think 20 minutes. Um, and uh, you have any questions or want to have a discussion? I'd be happy to do that. It'd be fun. Yeah. Hello from New York. Hey, Can from New York. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name's Jennifer Coots Clay. My field is aviation. Oh, great. I'm the author of a book called Jetliner Cabins. And um, the, the micro transit um, picture that you've uh, um, uh, described this evening is absolutely fascinating. And you're talking about land use. Um, but the uh, theories and the platforms for future practice um, relate to the developments uh, re um, with 30 ports. For example, last month, Coventry, England, they opened the world's first urban airport for electric drones and air taxis for local transportation. And I wondered about your thoughts. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, on vertiports and vertical takeoff, you did mention fractional ownership, you know, with um, small um, private jets. Um, there's charter um, uh, programs, there are charter programs, there's fractional ownership, hourly purchase, full ownership. We might see these developments, um, which you alluded to in micro transit, land use and Ariel, do you think um, that that's the way big cities are going to evolve over the next few years? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that we, in, yeah, I mean, personal aerial transport, I think is what you just asked, right? Not, not, not packages. Correct. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think we are, oh, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry, you know, two um, people or three people yeah. with a share ride on a small electric aircraft, which probably might look more like a mini helicopter rather yeah. than a mini um, aircraft. But it's all part of the development that you described, yeah, um, the individual treatment, the short distances, the flexibility. And I just wondered whether um, in, in your planning, you're also looking at the progress of these um, Verti ports. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, uh, we were, we were, I was just at a conference, I don't know, I, don't know, I, I felt like, I think it was pre-COVID, but I feel like with COVID, I just fell asleep and woke up. But sometime in that, that time frame, we were talking with Bell Helicopters about the same, same thing with packages. Um, and, you know, it really, really comes down to this in transportation. And I think you all, if you kind of thought about your trip, you're going to find that the thing that you value the most is your time. And as, as we get more and more congested, um, and what I mean by that is, I, I, I mean, I'm sure everyone on this call has been like, ah, oh, this has taken me so long to get from point A to point B, and it should have only taken me X, right? It's called reliability time. Um, and, you know, to me, what I have found in the movement of people, what we value the most, it's in every, every travel demand model, it's in everything, is, is time. And so you have a value of time. Right, and so when you have a value of time, and you can maybe get in a, you know, a, 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 some sort of personal aircraft or or a shared aircraft like this, and you can skip the queue, if you will, um, at a price, then then absolutely, because people are going to value their time. If we can make it less affordable than you know a personal helicopter, clearly, and it starts to become more and more, you know, I don't I don't know the the, the regulations behind it. I mean, I think those will probably have to loosen up clearly, um, but I could see that folks would. As we continue to, you know, exponentially get more population, because that's just math. <laughs> like everyone's like, "Wow, the city got big." I'm like, "Yeah, it's because we had babies." <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just kind of where we are. And as we continue to grow and, and urbanize, right? Because that's where jobs are and our travel time. Like, in, we'll take Los Angeles for example. When the average commute is an hour and forty five minutes, there are people there that are trying to figure out a way to sell a service to your average commute. 30 minutes. 
And if that's a helicopter or a light rail or something that can that can skip traffic, then then I could absolutely see something of, of that nature. Um, you know, and then and then the next question is who is it for? Is it only for, you know, you know, we have things called Lexus. I mean, you guys know this. There's it's called a Lexus lane, which is a, which is essentially your your what's called here in Texas, it's a managed lane. And you know, as a, as people will call it, Lexus Lane, because it 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 has a dynamic pricing, and I, and it kind of goes to your question, right? It has a dynamic pricing. So, and you guys may have these in some of your communities. Basically, if if it's really congested, I've seen it as high as like ten bucks to go four miles, or is you know, if it's not congested, it's twenty five cents. And the reason they do that is because they're trying to push people off the managed lane to keep it at a certain speed. However. Who can afford the 10 bucks? The people driving the Lexus. That's why it's called a Lexus lane. They're very controversial. It's the same with, you know, the some something like this is, you know, what's what's the price point? And, and I think that's really going to be the challenge. And if it's a public good, it's going to we're, we're a long ways off because a private good is going to sell that first. Um, because clearly that's going to increase your time. I, I mean, decrease your, your travel time. And I and I say that because I did I do this exercise when I when I do some trainings on on um, basically the movement of people travel demand modeling. And, and I ask everyone to run through this exercise of what their true commute cost is or what their true travel cost is. Because a lot of time, all we think about is um, our gas, our mileage, you know, maybe. Most folks don't even think about their mileage. They really think about gas. And, and but when you break it down, you have a, you have a, you know, depending on your car, it's, it's more than 50 cents. It's probably more like a dollar, depending on if you drive something at $40,000, it's a dollar. $20,000, it's 50 cents. So, you know, you're somewhere right in there per mile because that's the capitalization of the car. You have your, you know, and then you have your travel time and then you have your gas and you have all of these things that, that go into to your commute, your parking costs, your total costs. And, uh, and so when you start breaking it down and I break this down, I'm like, okay, I had someone that was traveling 35 miles that was, you know, a, I would say a junior associate in our firm. I had a senior associate or a principal in our firm that was driving five miles but yet his commute cost was higher because his value of time was higher. He put his value of time at whatever, $100, $200 an hour and the junior associate put it at $50 an hour. And why I say that is because people will use a product if it saves them time. That's what software of a service is doing and that's what transportation will get to in, in, in the near future. So, so do I see that happening? Absolutely, if it saves people time. Regulation, all the politics, I think it's a long ways off. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, thank, thank you, John, Jennifer. That's good. a great question. Thank you, John. Good question. Oh yeah, I, and actually, just and I, I'll ask the next question actually. But before sure. I do, I just wanted to share one thing. I, um, I actually have a picture. This is the Coventry oh, facility that Jennifer was talking about. It was in the Financial <laughs> Times uh, earlier this month or last month. Yeah. So you get, yeah. yeah they yeah. opened up in a in a car park. They opened the. Um, I mean, new, that's incredible! You know, what an idea! Park. Is this is this is this uh, a private private company? Public good? What is this? It, well, yeah, it's a private company called Air One, but I think yeah, it's part matter. of yeah. yeah the West Midlands. Coventry is part of the West Midlands. So Birmingham is the main city, and they yeah. have a big MTA essentially, or Passenger Transport Authority, sure. and they're very progressive. And, yeah. Um, I this imagine they are in some way sponsoring this. Yeah, I, I, I could see this, you know, I mean, <laughs> how much do you think a ride in that cost? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Uber I mean, surcharges you, you know that thing's going to surcharge, which, which makes, you know, when I kind of joke about God bless capitalism, then, then absolutely. We're going to, we will, we will find ways to, to make money off of, of moving you quicker, no doubt. But, <laughs> well, if I, if I could just mention one other point, please. You've talked about passengers who are time sensitive, yeah. but there are also passengers who are price sensitive. Right. So they could take the slower route, they could take the land operation and the time sensitive people um, could uh, opt for the um, aerial um, air right. one. Um, and so it, it, it seems that we're, we're moving ahead with these yeah. new options, new choices, but then there's the big question of the infrastructure and, as you said, the uh, municipal leadership and how those questions can be addressed. And yeah. it's great to talk about 
flying apparently the um, electric drones are the size of two double beds in one report apparently for delivering packages to car parks. Yeah, yeah. You know, I can imagine um, people saying, oh, well, if I can get a cheaper fare, I'll fly on the flying double bed, you know, with the cargo pass uh, mm-hmm. packages. Um, there are all sorts of options out there. Um, but how, how will how will territories or cities or governments start to handle the questions relating to infrastructure, the idea of these flying objects and um, lots of um, uh, local land use microtransit all scooting around the place the whole time. Um, Manhattan is difficult enough as it is with scooters and uh, electric bikes and trucks and and cars. How, how, How will the authorities, uh, do you think, start to plan for the future that, that you've described? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think it takes, you know, I think it takes uh, some visionaries, some leaders. I think it takes some, some, um, some success cases. Um, and then, you know, on the aviation is not necessarily my strong suit. So I don't think I could, I can answer that question. Um, but, you know, on, on ground transport, it, it really does take a visionary person that, what I have found, to be frank, is that people, the, the person really needs to care about the community and stay in the community. Um, I've seen, you know, here in, here in Austin, I've seen people come and go, they say, let's do big things, and then they're off to a, I'll say, bigger, bigger and grander city, I don't know. Um, and so that, you know, if you can have a, a strong leadership team in place that that's really said, look, we're going to move our people more efficiently, uh, more effectively, and, you know, the other challenge is, is, is there's a lot of, you um, you know, here, and I don't know if I'm assuming you're you're from the states, but everything is is bonded out, and we're broke. I mean, let's just face it; that's kind of where we are, and we're not broke. We choose to be broke. <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. And so, you know, we have less. You know, we don't have a lot of extra capital or extra resources to, you know, expand our thinking into research and development. And that's really a research and development. I think we can a little bit. We can dabble in it to actually spend a lot of resources and there's going to be challenging because we're still trying to deal with like, I live in Austin, Texas. We've, we've got water plants that are failing, right? I mean, let's, we're going to deal with that prior to, you know, investing in a, in a, in a, you know, a helicopter pad or a personal transport pad, my guess is. And so, you know, there's some, I think there's some, some dynamics at play that are much deeper. That's why I come from this policy background and from a policy level than from an actual, you know, I think it sounds it, it sounds great, but how do we how do we functionally get there? Um, it's, yeah. a, it's a it's a good question and a tough question. So so Robert, can I can I jump in with the with yeah the of course because, thanks Jennifer. Yeah, the, Jennifer, thank you. I I so just first thing to say is I know what it's like to be transit dependent. I I didn't own a car until I was about twenty six. No, there you go. I didn't grow up in the US. I grew up in the UK, but. Uh, You know, I experienced that fact that I had to live within a walking distance to a bus stop, um, which then got me to a train and things like that. So it um, it really did have an impact on on me. And I really wish at the time (laughs) this could have existed. And I don't think it really could have effectively without the advancement that we've had in personal technology. And um, so I guess my my question for you is that you talked a little bit about the technology challenge for a lot of the, I guess, the riders that this is this is really going to benefit the most. Um, I was just thinking about the older older generation out there that probably yeah. don't, you know, are really going to be a big community without vehicles. Yeah. Um, I mean, how do you get around that? This is this is a great on paper, and if you're sat in Silicon Valley and you're designing this, um, it looks superb. But of course, the reality is, I mean, how, how does it work when you're having to get people? I mean, I just couldn't imagine organizing my mother with using <laughs> the on-demand services yeah. of microtransit. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, Andrew. Um, you know, we do we we're investing a lot of money in um, the you know the public outreach. The education, um, we still create call centers, which increases the cost, right? Um, and I think that that's, you know, we're developing online tools to make it very easy for someone to book a trip. 
Um, the online tools are, are, are simple, but again, if you don't have internet, if you don't have a phone, and we're trying to create a you know equitable solution, um, I think that this is one of the challenges to this product. Um, you can't just walk out to the bus and catch a bus. You actually have to have something or do something to get the bus. Um, and, and I don't think we're, we're, we're trying to work through it. I, I think some agencies have done a really good job and, and most of them would say, well, we have a great outreach program and you can call this number and they'll walk you through it. Um, but that still doesn't take away from the fact there are unbanked populations. There are people that don't have a phone and there are people that don't know how to use a phone. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, it's an emerging product. I think that that will change as time goes on clearly, right? I, I mean, my, my, I said my kids in kindergarten, he probably knows how to use the phone, well, maybe not the phone, but the tablet better than me, <laughs> right? And it's just, you know, so, so as we know, that's gonna, that will, that will edge out a bit, that, 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 pop, that side of the population. So I think that I see this yes. as a 20 year horizon of a product and it's when year four, and this is just a, this, I would just argue that if someone were to come to me and say, hey, what's, what's the challenges with microtransit? There's that challenge and, I, and, I'm, and I'm diverging here just for a second. The other challenge is there's a really, there's, it's hard to cap how many users will use it. So from a budgeting standpoint, you can say everybody gets a ride within 30 minutes, but you can kind of project the demand. But if your demand is really, really strong and you still need to meet that 30 minutes, that means you need more vehicles and more vehicles. And you may need eight vehicles instead of four, which just doubled your budget. Um, and so you have to either degrade the service or, or put more public subsidy into the program. So those are the two big challenges that I see with microtransit. I'm sure we'll figure them out as time goes on, um, but that's, you know, to, you, I mean, that's really the challenge. Hey, Robert, thank you for the presentation. It's, yeah, it's of course. fascinating. Um, the one question I have, and I might've missed it in, in all your slides, um, but has, has anyone tried this in developing nations where there's a real high percentage of people that are transit dependent, um, practically everybody. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be interesting, you know, whether it's yeah. India or Brazil, you know, with some massive cities, massive congestion, uh, whether it's been implemented, microtransit has been implemented there. I, I couldn't, an, I, don't, I can't answer that question. I haven't done the research outside of, um, you know, our market in, in, in the US, um, but you know what, I, I can email you because our colleague um, has just moved back to India and she is transit dependent. So I will ask her what she is, what she has seen. Um, she does transit work and, and transportation planning there. So um, let me, uh, let me get back to you on that one. That'd be great. Yeah. It's a good question, actually. If you think yeah, about it, it, a lot of the developing countries, you know, um, uh, mobile banking is essentially enabled people to have banking services that just didn't exist before. So yeah. it's, it's a transformational power of that, you know, Communications device yeah. that carry with them. Yeah. I also have a I have a a really um, a good colleague or a strong uh, I don't know good relationship with a colleague at, at Via who is is really the I would say one of the forerunner companies that have have started microtransit in the U S and, and around the world so I can ask her as well what they if they if they've opened any markets in the in the developing country or or even thinking about it. Yeah, it's it's. Uh... You know, like the Philippines has a jeepney. I don't know if you've ever heard of jeepneys. Their network there, and India's yeah. got all those uh, auto rickshaws. Yeah. Um, yeah. But well, I know that's what I was thinking people. when you said that. I was like, well, they might, you know, they might already use some of that. But everything seems to be very point to point. Not, you know, yeah. not the micro transit and this notion of here's here's a smaller zone that people operate in. Um, it'd be it'd be very interesting. Uh, yeah. If anything like that's been tried. Yeah, I I, I would agree. I, I think I'll I'll look into that. You know, Robert, one of the things you mentioned about certain fixed routes that are very lightly used essentially get replaced because you've now got a, a far better level of service for the people because it's going to be point to point and it's obviously yeah. cheaper. Uh, but are you finding that there's a kind of a negative reaction? It's a little bit like when people lose their Amtrak service and they complain and, and nobody ever used it, but they just like to have it there. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, kind of. Um Yes and no. Yes, until they get educated that their trip is going to be better. Um, you don't have to, you know, I'm down here in Texas, it's hot. So you don't have to wait at the hot bus stop. We'll come pick you up and drop you off. Now, if they were to go, if here's the, here's where the challenge is, is if you, if you create your box that cuts your fixed route. So for instance, if your fixed route started in point A and went to point C and your box only went to point B and that's your limit, 
then yes, that person has essentially lost that, that trip. But try to create a system where they can transfer if needed. Um, but typically we're, we're looking at routes that are, that are, it's really the same 15, 20 people that are riding it. Um, and, and, you know, talk to them, accommodate them, et cetera. So, yeah, not so much. I don't know, Arthur, I, I know you've worked a little bit in this of, of when we reallocate bus stops. Have you seen any, um, have you seen any pushback? Well, I, I, that there are always people that will be disenfranchised. And that's, that's one of the issues with the large move to bus rapid transit. Uh, you know, when we saw the Houston reimagining project mm -hmm. is let's increase ridership by running more frequent service on main streets. And I, I think a lot of systems are not, they're looking at that metric of ridership without looking at the individuals. And I've been dealing with individuals for a few decades now. Um, so the, the folks that are disenfranchised are frankly the ones that concern me the most. And um, while you mentioned unbanked, I'm trying to come up with a polite word for undereducated. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you mentioned Baton Rouge. You know, you know, next door to that Mississippi has the uh, reportedly the lowest quality of education out of the uh, however many states there are. And if you ask somebody in Mississippi, you will, you'll probably get several numbers on how many states there are. Um, so the disenfranchisement, the lack of education, and it's not, not just us, us old folks that don't want to have to learn how to use this stuff. Uh, my wife in the last two weeks has uh, made several comments that the CVS drugstore she's been going to has eliminated cashiers. They've gone to self-checkout. She was there earlier this week and there was no one to help her. She had to do the self-checkout. She left the goods behind and said that she'd be going to another store. Um, here in Dallas, DART has eliminated some fixed routes and gone with a form of microtransit. They call it the go zone. Uh, fortunately, I'm still on a fixed route. So uh, if I don't drive to the train station as I did yesterday, you know, I, I, I could ride a bus, but there, there's an inconvenience factor for someone that even kind of understands this stuff on having to figure it out again. Uh, or I say again, because Uber keeps changing their, uh, uh, their application and how the application works. But I'm thinking of the folks in Baker, Louisiana. Right. Um, and those 47,000 people, I think that you showed out of Baker. Uh, and there was another, I think it was 48,000, 27,000, uh, somewhere else on, on that demand slide. And you know, a, a lot of those folks, I will say this, bus passengers are smarter than most people think that they are, but they're smarter because they've adapted. Yeah. And when you give them something new to adapt to, something brand new that they cannot imagine. That, that's why uh, when we did the uh, Amarillo system, transit mm -hmm. system redesign, uh, we gave them peas and carrots. We didn't ask them to imagine what they would like to see as a transit system because they could not imagine something they had never seen. And what all the only thing they had seen was extremely poor. Yeah. So having people understand that, yes, you can ride a micro transit vehicle, it will pick you up at the house. The driver may or may not be a serial killer but we're not sure, we're hopeful. You know, I, I, I think you have a lot of headwind there and then you have some institutional headwind. Baton Rouge actually had a request for proposal for a micro transit project before the Goodman Corporation came involved and before they, they did the study. 
uh, Baton Rouge went out with an RFP for a six month demonstration, I think including Baker. Mm -hmm. And it was a six month demonstration. Part of the one of your slides was the turnkey operation. It was a turnkey. And everybody in the administration thought that that was wonderful. I do a lot of work with the contractors, with operating contractors. They didn't get any bids because no one is going to do the capital investment and depreciate a vehicle or amortize a vehicle over a six month period. So I think some of the difficulty is that a lot of the people that we're serving, the unbanked, the undereducated, and part of the reason that they're unbanked is because a lot of them don't have two nickels to rub together. That's one of the reasons that the poor or lower income population spends more for goods is they have a dollar to buy a roll of toilet paper at 7-Eleven. You know, they don't have $7 at the same time to buy a case of it at Sam's or Costco. So the, the limited amount of money that they have is an issue, the training, the education. And, mm -hmm. you know, we always have to look at the fear factor. Uh, I hear complaints in the Dallas area uh, that just eliminated some service in the city I live in, in Carrollton, by going to the go zones. And these are not transit people. They just see that bus stops have been, been eliminated and the bus route has been eliminated. And the comment is, well, they've taken away the bus service. No education right. on the fact that there actually is a replacement. So I think there were, there were a lot of struggles with this. One of the things that concerns me is the interface with fixed route, because when you have high density, high ridership, you know, fixed routes are appropriate, but microtransit is sexy. Bus rapid transit is nothing more than express buses that we ran in the 1940s. We put a different name on it and it's sexy and plain old bus service which is what is serving that low income population, you know, get, seems to be getting short shrift. So, you know, from the academic standpoint, speaking as a transit manager, I see it as a way to provide much better service to many people, but also as a struggle, you know, and I'm thinking of Baker, Louisiana, and, and you know, some of the folks that really need the service, yeah, as a struggle there to get them on the service. Hopefully, once they try it, they'll like it. But, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think also, yeah, I did, there, there's definitely headwinds. I mean, I, I don't know, Robert. I mean, you, you mentioned it was it's an evolu it's an evolution. You know, this is That's relatively right. new, and I guess it's only as these systems go in place, I imagine, that we'll be able to unpick. I, I think it's part of that. Challenges. I mean. And then as these companies become more and more successful, they'll get more and more funds to do more and more research and development and hire, you know, bright students. Um, you know, I, I mentioned Via earlier. It's a solid firm. They're, they're hiring folks out of uh, Ivy League schools um, to help uh, with this program. And so now who would have thought maybe 20 or 30 years ago that an Ivy League school, I'm going to go do public transit when I, when I leave Harvard. You know, I'm not saying that, that I'm sure there were a few, but that's not, you know, it's a, it's a different that the younger, I would say that the younger generation that I have seen anyway is really embracing active transportation, really embracing this, this type of model of how do we move people more efficiently because, you know, y'all and me, I think you guys might be one generation ahead of me. Um, we're, we're tired of waiting in traffic. So now here's a way to monetize a product to move us more efficiently. Um, and, and to Arthur's point, I mean, microtransit is really demand dial a ride just in a zone with technology. It's really all it is. It's, and so it did reinvent itself, but it reinvented itself with today's technology. Same with BRT, it's the same thing, but now we have you know signal synchronization, queue jumping, some things that technologies help us do, uh, um, you know, vehicles that are talking to the intersections. 
um, talking, you know, uh, sending signals to the intersection, telling it to turn green. I mean, these are all things that we're trying to, to develop. So, you know, back to Jennifer's question about, you know, moving people through the air in these smaller pockets of communities is, is probably not out of the question if we continue to focus some of our talent, and I say our talent is in the workforce development into this field to really get strong, creative thinkers, um, you know, because, you, you, you know, Arthur's been a, an institution in the field and, and Arthur's been a great, strong, creative thinker. And there's, you know, you go out in the, in the industry and there's like, you know, 10 of them around the country, <laughs> not a thousand or 2000, right? Um, in, in that space. And so that's a, as more and more folks come into that space, I think we're going to see, you know, we're, we've got a, uh, you know, and, and I know Elon Musk is doing lots of interesting things and he's now uh, got a contract with the city of Kyle because he's moved down here in Austin. He's, he's all over the place to do a, um, a tunnel, like a, a, a people tunnel in, in Texas. And, and then he's got the, the what is the, the fast uh, the people mover that he's got over in the West Coast that he's been trying to do. So, you know, and, and going out to space. So how we're moving people is, is certainly, a, I think, a, a field that's getting more and more attention from, from, from capital and from some of the best and brightest. Yes, well, uh, Robert, uh, absolutely. I, and I'm also conscious that we, we've gone way over the time that we normally oh. finish. I, I yeah, really, no and I think that's testament to kind of how fascinating this, this, this topic is. I, uh, um, I really would like to thank you for, for your time. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm sorry, if we have more questions, I presume, Robert, you'd be happy if I just share your details and people can- Absol Absolutely. Yeah, please do. Um, be happy. Is there any other let yeah. me throw in one one thing, if I may, because Robert uh, mentioned Conroe, Texas. Uh, Goodman Corporation had me down to Conroe uh, multiple times to lay out fixed bus routes. They all stink. They are lousy. Author? Author? <laughs> and I designed there, there you go. That's all right. Because Conroe does not lend itself right. in the street pattern, in the density. Uh, in the nature of the transit dependent population, who are the only people who are going to use that type of transit. So I, I am thrilled that Conroe has done and is working with the micro transit study. Uh, in, in my mind, although they have been running fixed route buses for a while, I think microtransfer is the way to go and get rid of the darn fixed route buses. Yeah. In Monroe. yeah. So it, it can also be city specific. Yeah, absolutely, Arthur. And, and that's what we're seeing all over. And I, you know, I showed those headlines. I mean, it's just, you'll see if you, if, if you, you know, Google search and spend a few minutes on it, you'll see that it's just, and, and it's mostly the smaller, I would say, ur, suburban slash rural, the, the, the communities that developed as rural, and now the urban's pushed into them. Those are the communities that are doing really well for micro transit, if that makes sense. There's, you know, you guys probably all have those. I'm not for sure where everyone lives, but but you all have those communities that that you know they just kind of kind of pushed into the you know, well to the to the out of you know Landers and the Conroes and the Kyles and the you know the, the towns you don't hear of, but you someone would say I'm from Austin, but they're really from you know the, yeah, the smaller the metro. Yeah. That's right, and that's and that's because it's that. It's not rural where it's, you know, you really probably don't need much public transit, more on demand, you need more kind of that dial a ride. It's, and it's not urban where you need more of a mass transit. You really need a, a strong public transit providing good access to folks. So um, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting uh, model and, and uh, you know, we'll see where it heads. I'll tell you, man, it's fascinating. I mean, weather is the other feature that you mentioned. That's not something we ever worry about in the UK because it's always wet and miserable, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I wouldn't really like to have to walk very far to a bus stop well, during summertime in, in Dallas. So yeah, I mean, and it, and it, you know, and, and you know, you think about a, a non, you know, think about the north and you know, I don't know, Minnesota in the in the winter. Yeah. Right? I mean, I think that that's a that's a real concern for folks. And how do we and how do we, you know, and, and at the end of the day, the, the question that I ask myself is, you know, what are we trying to do as a society? And is transportation a critical piece where it needs to be a public good? Just like a road or some other some other resource, does it need to be a public good where it creates an opportunity for someone to get a job, be productive, be within society? And I think that the answer has been resoundingly yes for you know a hundred plus years. 
uh, and I think it will be, continue to be a public good. The question is, is how do we create a public good that serves both you know, transit dependent, which is that public side of things, but also move people more efficiently throughout your city because we have found that you know, moving people through rail or whatever is also a public good because it gets people off the road and there's a, a variety of public benefits. And when you, when you bond everything out and you don't pay, I'm not advocating for more taxes, I'm just saying you bond everything out and you don't have the money to do both well, you kind of have to pick and choose or start to become more efficient. And when, when someone comes on the market and says, hey, I've got a product more efficient, then you know, everybody's going to glom onto it. And that's, you know, that's really what's happened here. What's happening, yeah. Okay, yeah. so Rob, listen, on that note, Robert, I think that's a perfect uh, time to kind of wrap this up. I, sure. You know, thank you again. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll stop the recording now and we'll get this posted so that uh, we'll be able to see it. I'm sure there may be a lot of people interested in kind of reviewing this. We'll use yeah. it as part of our education program as well, Robert. No worries. It's fascinating. Great. So, thank you, Robert. Think, Thank, yeah. you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much. Thank Good you, stuff. <laughs> All right. Y'all yeah, have a great night. Thanks for inviting me. Good evening, Bye -bye